when we do startups, um, we have a tendency to be all excited about the idea and solving the idea. And we don't think nearly enough about the process of how um, people engage in new things. And so the fundamental thing comes out of this notion um, by uh, a, that was uh, in a book called The Diffusion of Innovation in 1968, I think is when the book was written. And it basically says people do new things, populations adopt new behaviors following a normal curve. And that's where we end up getting this Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm conversation. And so uh, Patrick and I dialogue often around this question of um, which group of people ought you be trying to talk to first? And yeah, crossing chasm, just like Charles is doing right there. Um, so if you take the diffusion of innovation and you apply it to marketing, then you get Jeffrey Moore crossing chasm. And then if you look at the lean startup conversation, which says, uh, don't build things that people don't want. Um, so then you uh, need to find people that are willing to change their behavior and spend money on new things. And those tend to be early adopters. And so I press on people focusing on finding early adopters. And yet Patrick has a different theory. And so we're going to hear more from Patrick now about how he sees finding the right people to talk to. So Patrick, you want to turn your video on and we'll go, I'll go into speaker view and. Yes, all right. Well, thank you for the intro, yes. And I have a slide dedicated to uh, uh, the debate between myself and John uh, later. And in the meantime, let me uh, open up my deck and I assume, let's see, all right. Can everybody see the deck that I'm sharing? Yeah. Yes. And Great. Quick question: Will the deck be made available after the the talk? Yeah. Fantastic. Can you paste? Can you paste a link of that into the document, uh, Patrick? That's what I'll do. Then I'll. Uh, I to be frank, I have tons of. I have a huge boneyard of slides that I need to yank out of it before I post it. So I won't post it for a few minutes after we're done. But let me get rid of that. Uh, all the dead slides. <laughs> So, John, do you still want to do the the survey that we talked about, or, or uh, do you want to? Yeah, I think I think it's worth your while to find out how many people yeah. are hunting for a job versus running a side gig versus a hundred percent committed or uh, engaged in revenue and employees. Right? Those are different people with different questions. Yeah, that's what I think. And so, I don't know how we're going to raise hands. Um, well, so why don't we practice that? If everybody goes into the click on participants, then I believe that if you look at that, let me get to the right window. Because I'm sharing, I can't see it to be frank. Pop out. And I think that if you do that, you should see a raise hands thing. So I yeah. see. Charles raising his hand. Yeah, right. So if you find the raise hand thing, so Patrick many, asked a question and asked people to raise hands. Yes, great. So number one, how many of you are in a startup or doing, uh, doing entrepreneurial stuff full time? Raise hands. John, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. So 14, 14 people out of 23. All right. Five. And then side gigs, that this startup is something you're doing on the side while you are uh, have another role full time. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so that's 20. Entrepreneurs, people who are working in full time companies, but they're trying to launch new stuff, you know, new products and new markets inside a larger company. Two. All right. Investors, people who actually cut checks to help people build startups. Two. All right. Thank you very much. I'm Patrick Hogan. 25 years, mostly of doing V1s. In fact, I only had one or two products that actually existed in market before I was involved as a product manager. Then both in startups and 
a lot of the things we'll talk about today were developed while I was trying to launch a new API for Office that uh, Satya said was their strategically most important asset when he took over his job as uh, CEO of the company. The theme is, you know, I want to help you get the market four to six times faster with a compelling offering versus an MVP that doesn't scale. Um, and uh, I help teams wait, uh, wait, stop wasting their time on the misleading feedback they get from 90% of the people in a market and then pivot and focus on the people, the psychographic segment that adopts new things and uses them to solve high value problems. So I'm going to talk about the challenge. The challenge of finding and getting a good signal in the market, the solution that I, that I was able to uncover, what the indicator is for that you use to go find how people lie across that adoption curve. I'm going to talk a little bit some complementary concepts and then how I've actually used it to help teams quickly apply the concept to their project. And again, it's how do you delight the pe right people fast? And the problem that I probably experienced firsthand, and I, didn't, I did experience the firsthand, whether I was in a startup and or a, a, an entrepreneur effort at a big company was trying to get good feedback. And there's a reason 90% projects fail. And part of it is it's, they're really risky. Breakthrough ideas, new markets, things are changing. Um, the, the challenge of getting market fit is big because of all this vagueness. And I've existed, lived, experienced, watched lots of wasted cycles, working on the wrong features, delivering the wrong messaging, um, teams just bleeding dry, trying to sell something to somebody who isn't ever gonna buy. Um, and often they're terminal because a lot of the projects just die because they're calling on people who don't represent the market or never actually start writing checks. But knowing this and getting the fuzzy feedback, what I've also seen is teams say, ah, let's just go ahead. And so they just take a shot and move forward. They say, I'm going to go on my gut. I know more than customers and they fire off. And that doesn't tend to be any more successful. Again, I have failure rates. Also, I've seen a lot of conflict because people have different data and different perspectives. And when you go with your gut, everybody has a different gut and they become ego-driven decisions which make for unhealthy dynamics. Yeah. And the other one is once they do agree, they do rapid MVPs and see what sticks. And oftentimes those cycles actually never land where you need to go. And so filtering out that noise and getting a signal so that a team can have healthy conflict resolution has been a big part of what I've tried to do over the last few years. And the, I'll call it the magic formula, uh, the magic insight came uh, because I had done some research when I was in grad school about how people can connect. And I was sensitive to the concept of psychographics. I understood them, had been thinking about them, and was very sensitive and had experienced the concept of, even in the same demographics, you have very different people and how they think and act. And the key point is, even though Jeffrey Moore talks about the curve and the different places, it's not a timeline. That's the big message I want you guys to hear. This curve is not a timeline. We're not at a point in time here or here or here or here. This is a grab bag of people like an IQ curve. You go out to your market, you throw a net, you pull people back. They have a normal distribution of how they think and act. That's the big kind of, oh. And so when you hear people talk about the adoption curve and how they use it, oftentimes they're just misleading. They don't understand the fundamental axis that this thing is on. So people in the same demographic, all the same. And they're always present. You know, there, there are late, early adopters and late adopters in every market or any potential market. So they're all there, present. It isn't as if because a market is a certain year old, you only have a certain group of people. They're all there all the time. And so if you go throw a net and you're trying to do something that's breakthrough, the front of the curve and the back of the curve are telling you misleading information for what it will take to get through this thing that Moore called the chasm, this change in psychographics. As we know, the front of the curve loves everything that's new and different and they jump in and they love it. 
And the middle of the curve, they only buy what's proven. They need to see it. And so if you go, I've done this. I've done this for large corporations where we wanted to go do something new and different. And they said, here's our customers, go talk to them. And they would tell me exactly what they wanted and then never buy. I built customers exactly what they said they wanted. And then they said, oh no, 10 other people have to use it before I'll buy it, even though it does what they said they wanted. We all know that I was trying to go from the front of the curve, a new place, you know, try to get a, a new adopter to use it and then get to where the money is in the fat part and jump. And, we, and again, the chasm concept is there where there's a bunch of people, they get lots of good information and they will tell you what they love, but they do not represent what people consider important and what is valuable for the rest of the curve and, and thus, Jeffrey Moore's painful experience of the chasm and 85% of his stuff dying. So what happens in the chasm is not some timeline thing again. It is a change in thinking. The person in that chasm goes from the early adopter mindset of I love new stuff, whatever's new, give it to me. It's shiny, it's new, it's different to what's it gonna do for me? That is the big change. Now he identified that, but he didn't give me a tool to go do something with it. So lacking that, I found this to be the best metaphor that I've seen is you're hearing all, you're hearing feedback from the whole market and you're just throwing arrows, trying to hit something and often hit nothing. You may be viable, it may work, but it may not hit a customer value. So I had to figure out how to make that a group discoverable. So how was I going to figure out who that person is? Now, what I want to do was get the, the market indicator. We just talked about it, and you guys are familiar with it. The people on this part of the curve, as enthusiastic and technically competent and interesting and engaged and enthusiastic they are, the reason the chasm exists uh, and is well proven and why there's high failure rates is what they tell you is important is not what the mass market is. That's why the things fail. So there's a huge shift in the market in how they think and experience and what they're doing. Now, the way people deal with that now is, you know, they target a, a, an MVP at early adopters, they get in there and they work through it and they keep iterating in hopes that they'll find something that will make it to the majority, to the middle of the market. They're working hard, they're going to be the ones that get through there, but most don't make it, they run out of money trying to make something that sticks. So, the, the hypothesis is, for me as a product manager, who's gonna go do good customer development, I need to find this group. Since they're the ones that have the skills to make something work and also smart enough to do it in a way that when they're done with it, it actually makes it across and the mass uh, majority really like it. So I went out and I did research to try to find, when I did this, find, hey, where's that indicator? And I had done research Again, back at grad school on what a good indicator was. When someone walks in a room and you ask question, what's a statistically predictable question and answer that you should hear? In decky terms, I was looking for a good data model. And then the responses to that data model as to an indicator of, of where they lied along the curve. And I heard a lot of conjecture. You know, Jeffrey Moore talks a lot about his categories, but they're descriptive. They're not prescriptive for me to go filter people. Um, and so I didn't find them. And people were guessing, they say things. But as I said, even professionals in the medical field of predicting psychology took them decades to come up with a model. It isn't a conjecture. They blew it, by the way, on four or five attempts before they got to one that worked. So I decided I could go do it myself and it took a few years. But I went through a series of research efforts exercises that actually did come up with a predictive model for where people sit and what to do with it. So hundreds of interviews in qualitative, building on the psychographic work that had been done. So I could take, hey, what, are, how, what models worked? How did they use them? How did they prove them? How did they disprove them? And uh, finally, when I got a couple of models, I went out and did a big research study of you know, almost 1,400 people talking about 
very complex projects, almost 4,000 projects with 200,000 decisions and 400,000 data points, demographic, psychographics, data. And I used Shapley value game theory, things that these early studies didn't have, and pseudocono data analysis. So I, I poured into some pretty sophisticated analysis and was really happy that one of the three models I checked with all this data actually proved to be a great predictor. What I did is I laid out the capabilities that the teams had along the axis. So I had good data that said, these guys trying, trying crazy technology and this guy's using old technology and the whole span in between. So I had all that data and then I could actually predict who people were because of two questions I could ask them. And the two questions is, do you know your risk before you do a project you haven't done before? And it, then you ask them, what did you do about it? And so those two questions had lots of answers in a spectrum that you could peg people, but it proved to be highly confident and statistically accurate uh, predictor for where people light up along the curve. And I'm gonna walk through that before I jump through it. Well, no, I'll walk through it quick and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop for questions. So when I asked the question of, do you know your risks? The first question, it turns out the people on the front of the curve and the people on the back of the curve had exactly the same answer. No, <laughs> they don't. So they, they, it was amazing. I couldn't tell the two apart. But when I asked the second question of these groups, the front of the curve, the way they coped with not knowing was, yay, and they ran towards it. They said, I, that's interesting. In fact, it's only interesting if I don't know it. And the back of the curve just had the flip. They ran the opposite direction. I don't know what's going on, so I'm going to run away. Um, I heard a metaphor. Uh, I don't know if you, anybody knows who Dr. Drew is, Adam Carolla. They had a radio show. And the Huns came over the hill to your village. And some of the people ran away. And some of the people turned around and said, hey, let's party. And so these are just natural reactions that people have to threats or risks. And that's how the front and the back of the curve dealt with it. Now, as I started from the, the later adopter category and worked my way towards the middle, what I heard in my interview started to play out. People started to actually be able to clearly identify what could trip them up. So that first question started to get more precise. Their answers started to say, yeah, I know my risks. Hmm. And when I pushed them in the qualitative work, they kind of didn't know, but they thought they knew. And towards the middle, they actually started getting pretty articulate about what it was that was potentially going to be a problem on any project. But when I asked them, what do you do about it? They just said, eh, I don't know. I just do what's proven. I go look for somebody who's done this many times before. Again, this was the story of my work on trying to pick new products to old customers is, yeah, I, I'm not going to take it until it's been proven 10 times before. So that's the way they talk. And it turns out that the early majority was this equally informed. About the time you hit the middle all the way forward, they actually can tell you what their risks are. But it turns out that knowing the risks didn't mean they had the skills to cope with which I, I, at the time I did the work, I found it fascinating. They knew what was going to potentially be a problem. They said, yeah, I just do what someone else has proven. And they cope by following just like the people who actually didn't know what their risks are. So they might have used this exact same solution, even though somebody knew what the problem was. And what I found was this group, this sliver on the front that somewhere around 10% of every market as a psychographic where they not only know the risks before they did a project or tried something they hadn't done before, they had very prescriptive actions for how they dealt with each type of risk. So they had very clear, very different answers to these, these questions. So before I move on, any questions? I guess I'll take that as a no. So now that I knew how to identify them, I could look at the data, again, had piles of data. I could say, okay, well, let's go dive into these, this group and say the people that actually know the risk types they deal with before they go do a project and they actually go manage those risks in a very prescriptive way, what makes them different? How can I find them? What do they look like that can help me find them in the real world? 
So what I found was they did have a very unique combination. Their goal was to win. And the best way I can characterize this is when I did the qualitative work to develop the model, they said, I intend to be the disruption that everyone else has to chase. That's my job. That was the way one guy described it. I want to get a competitive advantage using something no one else uses that they'll have to go, ah, I've got to do that too. So he wants to set the flag that the followers have to chase. That's his goal. Now, other people have that goal too, by the way. There's a bunch of people that fell out in this category, but they didn't have the following capabilities. These guys, people, knew what their risks were on any one project, and then they very carefully metered and mitigated those risks. So one guy actually started looking like he was uh, in the movie Minority Report, if you've ever seen it. Time it was groundbreaking. There was a lot of holographics, and he was swiping in the air and moving things around in multiple layers of, of, of screens. And a couple of them actually did that. They said, I have 10 risks, and they waved their hands around in the air. And here are the 10 risks. And when I look at a project, I go, oh, this one has these three risks, this one, this one, and this one. And one of those is huge. So I'm going to work on that and mitigate that risk the most I can for the least before I actually move forward. And then the next thing was, which was part of how they thought, is they satisfied on the project. So they never polished. They were all about effectiveness. They never actually made it perfect because they would address that project, that risk, until it wasn't the biggest risk. Not until it was zero, until it wasn't the biggest risk. By the way, I, I pushed on this as an engineer by training. I pushed on this hard, and it was amazing how indignant they got. Now, they thought I was a silly boy, silly man, because why would I bother optimizing something that just may never have a payoff? They got very indignant about it. Of course, that's my job, is to figure out why he was doing that. But it was. It was interesting how they had that common turn when I pushed them hard on that. So it turned out that I was talking to, uh, and the reason I actually dove into it in detail about some other characteristics I'll talk about later is these guys had twice as much money as everybody else. So when I normalized by size of the firm and the role and the company and the industry, for every dollar the front of the curve had, and every dollar the back, by the way, was about equal, these guys had two because they were really effective at helping their teams be uh, a winner. And so they got big payoffs for it. And uh, they also, because of that, they had almost all of the free money because everybody was kind of, most of their money was tied up in pre commitments and paying, keeping the lights on and the systems working and the the budget for the team. And then they had 10% or so of, hey, go play like you want. These guys had, for every dollar of keeping the lights on, they had a dollar of go play. So they were the, for, uh, the place the money was. So a lot of good reasons to go talk to them and engage with them versus everybody else. Now I'm going to come back to this also. This is an important characteristics that I found in them is earlier I talked about how they thought about risk. Hey, I'm going to do a project. I'm going to manage risk. I'm going to take one risk at a time. They were equally skilled and they used the same kind of theory of constraints model for the projects they picked. And this is why I call them the gate. They had goals and they were really clear about what their goals were to help their team win. Again, why they had twice as much money as everybody else. And they're looking for the very best tool that no one else has. And they just want to use the best tool. They don't care. If it's the best tool, it's the best tool. They're, that, and and in, in the right way, that's where more talked about them being really pragmatic. So they don't expect that solution to solve the problem. The, that goal doesn't have to be, you don't have to make it go to zero. Your job as an entrepreneur is to give him the best hammer for the job he's focusing on, not to make that nothing. And if you're just that, so the, the minimum compelling offering to him, something he said, that's a great tool, does not have to be a complete stack. Um, he's just looking for the best ROI of, his arm, of swinging his arm. 
So every time I've used this, the team has had a very complex MVP and I've found that they could take a, a sub part of their complex technical solution and pull it off and go actually solve in a compelling way the thing that the uh, gateway adopter was looking at, what, what he's looking for to help me address my biggest thing. A great illustration, hey, in the, uh, in the apparel business, I was interviewing someone in the Bay Area. They were looking to reduce their returns. I don't know if you know, but most of the outlet stores are an outcome of having to take back all the clothes that don't sell in the primary retailers. And so the amount of clothes they take back is three to four times their profits. So what they did is he said, my goal is to help us do a better job of not having to take returns. So he got a social a group that looked at social media and would look at the trends in the micro ge geographies around the Bay Area, would literally change his supply chain by having people get on chat boards and audit, and this is just humans taking guesses, what were the styles, what were the trims, what were the shapes, what were the colors, and he would literally ship, take, intercept trucks that were going to San Jose and said, hey, you're a truck full of stuff that doesn't matter anymore, but it's still good for Oakland. Pass up San Jose and go up to Oakland. And so they had this ricky dink group of people who were auditing social boards, taking in data and changing apparel according to its delivery or construction according to what they could change when they could change it. And it was, it was just a ragtag of spreadsheets and and Word documents that got passed to people. It was terribly unstructured. But he beat their return rate from over 4.5% down to less than 1% in the span of a few months because he got the right stuff to the right store that was going to get moved. And I looked at him and said, hey, aren't you going to kind of codify this solution and start actually adding? And he goes, why would I do that? That's a giant waste of energy. I have no idea if this project is ever going to go anywhere long term. This may not be the right problem. I have another problem. He beat this down. So it was still there, but he had other things to worry about. So he never swung his hammer at that project again since he was done with it, even though it was kind of inefficient and technically flawed. It was effective and he had other fish to fry. So the job you have to do as an entrepreneur is not make that problem go away. It's just be the best tool for him to swing until he has to think about another project. So I'm asking or imploring you guys that you need a new skill. <laughs> you have to fight the instinct to do what you normally do. And to scale, you have to talk to gateway adopters. And you have to fight an instinct because most of the feedback, feedback can be hard to get, but it's wrong. And the biggest enemy is you is don't let your desire to get feedback get you the wrong feedback that's going to send you down the wrong path. Don't engage people just because they'll talk to you. They're well-intended. They're well-meaning. They will try their very best to be a good human, especially in these times where everybody's really nice to each other in a, in a time of crisis. They will put a ton of energy into telling you what they think is the right answer. But if they're the wrong people, it's going to mislead you and harm your effort. So the skill you have to gain is filter out the very well-intended but misleading and potentially harmful feedback you're gonna get from people who don't fit part of the adoption curve that's gonna be the people who are your likely best customer. Again, this is a bias. You wanna tell your story. You wanna hear people tell you it's a good story. They wanna help you do the good story. All doesn't matter and all could be terribly misleading. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, oops, sorry, each of these, those three traits I talked about. So what they do and what they don't do. So if you get a conversation, you just say, hey, tell me about your last project. You listen for some of these traits, goals. 
did they do it to win? Did they do it to get ahead? Did they do it to be the disruptor? Why were they doing it? What was their motive for picking that project? If they tell you, oh, you know, I don't want to lose. I want to keep up. There's something I have to do. I'm polishing. I'm optimizing. Or it's technical novelty. The front of the curve is very like, oh, this technology was really cool. If that is their focus, I'm saying, if you want to scale, that's not the right people to listen to to drive your investment. Risk management. Gateway adopters do pursue risk. They, it, if it isn't risky, actually, they don't do it. So everything they do is, by its choice, a risky project. They, but they know their risk types. If you say, well, what could trip you up? Boom, boom, boom. They will tell you on that project what the potential downsides are. And then they have a portfolio of mitigation tools. I, mean, I was talking earlier about the guy who uh, was, was acting like Tom Cruise in Minority Report. He will, they will tell you that for a risk, they could do this, this, or this, or this, or this. They were very clear about what they're going to do when a certain kind of risk shows up in a project. And the big uh, question, big, the discovery when I peeled through all that 400,000 data points, that was the best indicator for whether a person was a gateway adopter was the single question about do they invest in developing partnerships that are specific to mitigating different kinds of risk? So it's a complex question. It's kind of three-parter. They had to know that they know their risks and that they were investing in actually getting better at mitigating their risks. And that part of that was they go out and find great partners. Now, partners are just could be people. If I'm talking to an artist who's a creative, and they want to go new things. When I use these words, that it doesn't mean not make not sense. But if I say, "Do you know somebody that can take care of the biggest problems that you know you could run into?" They go, "Yes, I have Joe, or I have Rick, or I have Kathy. They are the people I know. Each one has a specific skill set that they can help me." If you're going to talk to someone who's not a gateway adopter. <clears throat> what they'll, if they have an answer, if they're on the front of the curve, they'll go, ah, I don't know what my risks were. I'm going to go anyway. I'm going to go do it. They're actually attracted to the fact that they don't know it, but they are blind. And that's why they have high failure rates. Or they follow. I only use what's proven. Or the late, latest adopter is I avoided all the other. Uh, I don't know what the risks are. And I, I just don't go there. And they think of partners as capacity. So when I ask them the question about, um, you know, on a one to five scale, do you invest in these, uh, in finding partners with specific, for specific risk? They would say, no. And it was a dumbbell shaped curve. That's why it was our, our answer. They, I had everybody, you know, 85, 90% of the people were one end said, no, partners are capacity. If I need somebody, it's just about getting a suitable person. It's just about getting a body that fix, is a cog in the machine. While the gateway adopter at the other end was very clear about, yeah, I'm going to do something I haven't done before, and this person has expertise, that I'm going to suck them dry on, on knowledge. So my assertion is you go in and you hear somebody talking about, I don't, I don't know the risk, but I'm going to chase it anyway, or um, I'm going to avoid it, or I'm going to follow what other people have done, and I just need bodies to fill slots, not skill sets, that do things I don't know anything about. Don't talk to them. So in the project management, I alluded to it earlier about the project selection process and the project management process have very similar theory of constraints behaviors is the gateway adopters all care about effectiveness. Their solutions are satisfying. They get the job, it's done the job. Efficiency is not part of their vocabulary. The first people who are not gateway adopters, they're polishing, they're trying to be efficient, they're trying to do the same thing they've done before, but faster, cheaper. They're polishing and optimizing. That's what they're trying to do. It's not a bad thing. It's just they're unlikely to take the risk of trying to do something that hasn't been done before because they're rewarded for making sure things don't go bad. Again, remember, they're in it to not lose. 
they're not necessarily in it to win. So because of the nature of how they're thinking and how they're doing things, not really going to get you where you need to go. Not the people who are going to try something that's unproven. So I'm going to go back to this. You guys may have noticed, hey, I just grabbed some stock footage from Adobe. I'm trying to illustrate a point. If you don't know your target, you may not hit anything. A gateway adopter would say, yeah, great. It's an Adobe. You, told, you illustrated the point. Do you really need to spend time finding the perfect picture that doesn't have Adobe stock on it? No, they don't care. You just go through it. You got the time. It didn't have to be perfect. They wouldn't waste their time optimizing the perfect image if you told the story really quickly. You just do it. So. This is where uh, John may jump in. And if I don't tell the story, uh, I give uh, uh, his point of view good credence, which I totally agree with, by the way. It, our, argue, our discussions are not arguments. There are ways to be refined about what we say. There are people on the very front of the curve that mm, I'm saying you probably shouldn't talk to. And I'm saying the people in the middle curve, they're or behind not good people for you to talk to. They're gonna give you a signal that's not gonna help you be successful. But there are the people that are, that are early adopters and they love new cool stuff and they do have great skills and can give you technical feedback. You can do MVPs with them to refine your team, to help build your team. And hey, if they show up and wanna give you money to solve that problem, it's a technical issue, and it's gonna help you get where you need to go, at least part of it. Great, I'm not saying run away from them, but realize the signal they're giving you can be risky. So if you're doing, if you have a new team, you're trying to build a team, it's okay to target early adopters, especially if you're doing a lean model where you're doing small steps, maybe doing things at startup week or building a, a viable product but I urge you not to fall in love with the MVP that you're creating. Because to scale, if you want to make something that the mass market will say, yes, you're solving a problem I care about, uh, engage and be compelling and do something that, again, compelling to the gateway adopter. Because and the big change in their psychographic is they go from being technically interested and wanting to do things that are elegant and beautiful and hard to do and, that, and you yell love them for it, to, I don't really care. I want this new thing, but I want to win. And so building something that's compelling for them is how you're going to be able to make it through. And I, when I help my teams think about what they're doing, I help them create that North Star about what the value prop needs to be to win, and then help them figure out how to get there. Team dynamics are part of that picture. So. If you know and how to get a hold of gateway adopters and engage them, not only is the mindset good for customer development and making sure who you're going after, to engage them, to test your hypothesis, to refine your vision. And I even create what I call gateway adopter vision teams, which is a handful of people who fit the profile that in real time, I go back to them with the highest risk decisions that the team has and says, hey, I'm gonna, it might cost me a thousand bucks because it's like a focus group but they all fit the psychographic. And we go, hey, here's our big risk, high risk issue. And I put that as a kind of an AB test or some other test that I can talk about later about uh, defining what's the lighter. That is the way I help my teams is quick real-time testing with the people who are actually most likely to lead the market. But also because of the things I shared earlier, it's very leverageable in things that kill teams. You can have a compelling message for them that would be something that is, well, you have to be compelling to them, but if you use what's compelling to the middle of the market or the front of the market, you actually repulse them. There is a way to have a message that is about winning and being having the competitive advantage and the fact that you're offering them a way to mitigate their risk when they try something that's never been done before. Those are very attractive capabilities. And so your marketing, if you want to get through the gate and get to the mass market, you have to start by messaging what helps this person win. You're basically, your competitive advantage 
is you're helping them get a competitive advantage because that's what they care most about. Shouldn't be about efficiency. Shouldn't be it's been a million times before. Um, that message just is actually kind of repulsive to them. They say, oh crap, if you've done it a million times, that means I need to find something else. I need to leapfrog whatever you're telling me. And then the other part that kills teams is making sure you use those characteristics, that mindset, that those motivators and that methodology to help your sales team actually qualify who's most likely to buy really quickly. And like I said, there's a single question that was 85% predictor. And if you just share that with your team in your, the context of who they're calling on, um, you can make them wildly more successful when you invest in actually trying to scale. Now this is part of my mantra. This whole, what we've talked about today is the first pillar to, I think about how I help teams grow revenue fast because I get way more precise about three components. For the people that lead a market, I help my teams create compelling offering and help them deliver. And so what we did, what I've just done is I've talked about how you make sure you engage the right people. The other two pillars uh, are things, actually I've been invited by Roy to give this presentation to the Lean Startup. We're going to talk about how do you get into a conversation or, and help your team deliver what's compelling and strip back the stuff that is got to be there or doesn't have to be there at all. And then uh, the final point is uh, actually because I saw these guys were successful at high risk projects and I had all the data, I went in and looked at the data and I figured out how they were continually successful at doing that risk management. What is the mechanics of their risk management? And what I've done is I've helped my teams think about their value risk, usability risk, technical performance, and their go-to-market risk, and pull these apart so they could quickly mitigate the biggest risk they were experiencing at that point in the project until it wasn't the biggest risk and then move on to the biggest risk. And so I help teams focus on the, and get the biggest ROI for their project and time because of the situation they're in and the risk that's most likely gonna hurt them. Now, all of these are decision points. So beyond lean and agile, these are decision models for what you do. They're not how, they're complementary to lean. I'm not telling you to do something different. I'm just saying, when you have decisions about who you go after, there's a way to think it through. When you think about what you build, what it looks like and what's compelling about what you do, there's a way to figure that out. And when there's a way to think about, well, where do I invest my time and energy in my project right now so I can get the best return the quickest time to revenue, I was able to harvest that and you guys can emulate how these guys were successful with high-risk projects. And let me tell you, this is an example of a startup that hired me uh, to help them. Uh, it was a game company. And the story is about helping them go from an MVP to an MCO for gateway adopters. And it was a sponsored game. It was online. It engaged fans of a domain, could have been basketball, or football, or baseball, or the Oscars. Um, they're, the prototypes that went the farthest were around basketball, and actually they worked with the Knicks to do this. And it was very much a simple game, agree, disagree. And bloggers would put an agree, disagree panel on their site, and that would keep uh, readers coming back. And there was a central hub for the game where it was sponsored, there was an overall tally, because you could play by agreeing or disagreeing with 20, 30 different bloggers. And on the central site, the hub of all these blog sites, uh, you would see if you were the smartest, smarter than all the bloggers, and were you all smarter than all the other blogger people who were uh, debating the bloggers. And so um, I was hired to help them as a product manager. And what I did is, um, made an assessment of where they were. And again, it was a game and they were going to do custom graphics and they were to do custom content so that when a player came to a site and the blogger was saying, hey, the, you know, I'll say something, the Mariners are going to lose the next game. Um, you could agree or disagree. And that is what the content was about. Um, they were going to roll out an MVT, MVP and they were going to go to the whole market. And the team had lots of disagreements about what they needed to do, how much energy they should put at each place. And by the way, they're really nice people. And so their disagreements were all mostly hidden. 
because they didn't want to fight about them and they liked each other and they didn't like conflict. Um, but when I was one on one, I found out there were lots of disagreements and they didn't have a way to resolve them. And so the deliverables were they had an 18 month roadmap and they were a year into it and they had nine more months to go. So the revenue and getting sponsorship, they had some interest, but since they actually weren't, the game wasn't getting played, they, uh, I don't know when we're going to actually start bringing in some revenue. So what I did is I understood and, and could quickly go work with them to find who a gateway adopter blogger was and what was compelling to them to be really clear about it. And when we filtered it all down, they just look, increase my visits and my duration. More people visit more often and have lots of returns. Simple, easy to prove. <clears throat> and so we sat down in one planning meeting and came up with a way to deliver something that would do that uh, six times faster. So we found out the first iteration they could do when we found a delighter for the gateway adopter was something they could deliver in six weeks. It was a simple game. It didn't have to be customized. It didn't have to look like the site. It was just Vegas odds for the domain. They would say, okay, you can uh, talk about the Mariners game and you could pull down the Mariners game odds for that week. And that turned out to be a delighter to bloggers, just a game on my site. The second iteration, which was an expensive SDK, was gonna take about three months. <laughs> they found out that didn't matter. A game didn't have to look like my site. They didn't care. So they cut more than a man year after, uh, in fact, Six weeks into the project, after I we had this planning meeting, they actually dropped the entire man years worth of work, um, and the uh, they they started working on the game being based on content, so it could be custom, custom work. But they were able to engage sponsors because six weeks after the planning meeting, it was working. They had users. They had again. They were able to engage the Knicks. So in the, in, at the end of a 90 minute meeting, because I talked to gateway adopters on a few calls, <clears throat> we were able to deliver something in six weeks and not nine months. Because again, a gateway adopter didn't expect you to drive the, the challenge of more readers down. They just wanted you to be the best solution for it compared to the alternatives. And so they had potential sponsor conversations going on in six weeks and they drunk a third of their roadmap. So one of the things I'm trying to do um, with the help of Keshav and others is package this insight so that people like you guys who are starting something out where there's lots of degrees of freedom and you're trying to figure out what you do can use this insight. So we've come up with a concept of a, a boot camp where the first session we help you, sorry, we help you create a vision and a hypothesis that's about creating a value prop for gateway adopters, defining what you do, what's different, the problem you're going to do, and then <clears throat> develop the muscles to overcome your instinct, to come up with a recruiting plan and scripts to go find them, and then actually an interview script to actually find out what they think is most compelling, and then engage them, have the conversations, and then come back and help iterate on your MCO to figure out what you can do to be compelling to that group. So, that's the way I'm trying to package what I do so that you guys can have a compelling roadmap, uh, what to build uh, with the people who lead the market in just a few weeks. So my takeaways from today is first, the, the recognition that within any market, people are not the same. And it's something that, that John uh, brought up when he did the introduction quite well is they're not the same. So you have to figure out how to get involved with the people that, that you need to talk to. Um, now, to get them, you can scale or adapt to a dynamic market. So it turns out that these are the people, because they know what's important, quickly shift. Just like when they pound down that first goal, suddenly that first goal is no longer relevant because of the market dynamics. They know what the next one is. They are the sh first one to be able to pivot look at the next goal and think about the challenges that they have. I've seen it happen. I've, been, I've seen quick changing markets and I've stopped, been engaged with serial dialogue over a span of years with gateway adopters and I've seen them adapt to those kinds of changes. Um, <clears throat> make sure you're compelling to them. 
and that there's a way to do that and find them because you can have a conversation with them about risk and figure out where people are. That's the dialogue you want to get into. And you may have to use a different word in your domain, but it's all about what can take your knees out. And to do this, you're, what you're trying to do is deliver something that's compelling to the leader. And again, when I've done this, uh, I've typically helped my teams deliver in uh, four times to six times faster than they really thought because I've been able to help them find compelling, which is a, had been a lower benchmark than they thought, and then strip back what they were doing to do compelling. So my question is, what, what next? What would you guys be most interested in? You know, if John wants to play MC or if there's a Q&A, this is a good spot for a Q&A if we'd rather do that. <clears throat> so I think that uh, what uh, I'm hearing you ask is, if we were to do the next step, what would you like that to be? Yes. What would you like the next step to be? Yeah. So in terms of this event, there's a set of questions in the document that I think it's worth us walking through. Um, and I will get those to you in a moment. But um, in terms of follow-on events, what yeah. would this audience like to see for Patrick to work on for you? Yes. I don't know if we do a vote again or, uh, or you guys want to follow and just put it on the Google Doc. Um, but I would hope that you guys could verbalize maybe and, and, and uh, share what, what your thoughts are or questions. Uh, hey, about Patrick. these options. <clears throat> Patrick, this is Tom. Um, I love the idea of a boot camp. I like that you've suggested it. As you've been talking with me previously and then this afternoon, it's occurred to me that um, one of the issues here is that we're startups who don't have any resources, we don't have any money to, to help you disseminate this idea. But we do um, in a smaller way, and if we are to collectively subscribe to a boot camp, maybe that gives you enough cash flow to keep this effort going and you get the benefit of your coaching. Yeah, I, I, that's, uh, Keshop has been super uh, instigated in, into that model. And, and I'll go back just to, you know, what I would do is I would deliver some of the templates that I've helped teams use in the past and develop about, hey, I'm gonna help you make a decision. There's a couple of pieces of collateral for each of these stages. I'd, I'd share those with you. And then we'd set up a three hour meeting online and we'd walk through the collateral and I would do my best to coach you. Uh, it's, a, it's a do with you model. I'm sorry, it's a do with you. It's here it is, you guys go away, do some homework. I spend some time with you with a deliverable <laughs> at the end of it, each of these sessions and then the the variable would probably be, uh, you know, how much help you want from someone like me to actually go do the recruiting and interviewing uh, stage. So, so I pasted into the chat the questions. It, the chat messes up the formatting a bit. They're easier to read in the joint document. Maybe that's a good place for us to walk through with people what the questions are real quick. Um, but a lot of people are timing out, so we should do that quickly. Okay. Um, why don't I stop sharing this? Maybe I should share the Google Doc, and yeah. and then we can we can talk about that. So let me. I'm trying to find the stop sharing. Yes, there it is. Stop sharing. Um, do you want to share the Google Doc and Drive, or do you want me to? Sure. Let me do it. I and this is a good, and, and clearly, if you, know, if you have a question about any of the, the four options, please let me know where we could follow up later. I've shared my contact information on that Google Doc. So here's the Google Doc. So, what's the difference between a gateway adopter and an early adopter, and why is this distinction important? The biggest, so the, I'm going to start in reverse. So the, the biggest reasons it's important is if you want to scale, if that's your goal to try to reach the mass market, the early adopters, what they want, what they like, has little to no indicator of what the mass market wants. That's why the chasm concept exists, because Jeffrey in his venture days are busy 
spending money and getting all this awesome feedback back with early adopters and 85% of them was failed and he was baffled. So that's the reason not to, or, or not, that's the downside of, uh, that's the importance of, of, of making sure you know who you're talking with. Again, to, to uh, give credence to John's point, uh, working, getting your team to be a functional team so they can iterate quickly, think quickly, focus, deliver. Um, it, it might be a good group to, to get to early adopters, but realizing that in order to scale, you've got to talk to uh, the gateway adopter type. So to drive in that a little bit more, if I am a startup team with a small team and I've never done this before, my sprint should be focused on how do I get to cash flow positive fastest, not how do I get to the largest market or the biggest payoff, but how do I get to cash flow positive fastest? So I can use early adopters to get to cash flow positive to then give me the capacity to build uh, what the early majority want without um, being in the having to run for money all the time problem. Yeah, and, and I'll point out again that oftentimes I've found that early adopters expect a more elegant and robust technical solution than gateway adopters expect. Because of the different metric, You, I believe, and in, in what I've helped my teams do is by focusing on the minimum compelling offering value prop for gateway adopters, they actually don't build a lot of technical stuff that a early adopter would consider to be required. Sure. And, and they are great at helping you deliver technology, uh, but make sure you understand the value prop that you're going after. Did I answer the question or should I revisit it? No, you did a, a fine job and I took notes into the document. So then, okay. um, I'm seeing here, sounds like Patrick is seeking uh, MCO for packaging this marketing approach for entrepreneurs. That's fair, yes. Yeah, all right, good. So then the next question is, what are you doing, when you are doing interviews, how can I tell who I'm speaking to? Um, what questions do I ask them? How do I um, engage and figure out what kind of person I'm talking to? So I consider the filter for uh, an interview to be a, a stage, right? So we have to fight the instinct to just want to talk and get good feedback and have people love you and them to love us and, and all those. So I say, I need to ask them about how they behave when they're doing things they haven't done before. And I get them to tell the story. In a rigorous model, if it's a quant model or you're reaching out on emails to a bunch of people, the first filter I ask is for that domain. So I, I, I spin it a little bit. I ask an AB question is, would you be more interested in finding out a way to, and then basically in that, for that domain, I say, keep up with the Joneses, no, not lose. Or are you interested in doing something that's new, but will give you a competitive advantage? I do that AB test and guess what? 75% of the people pick A that I don't want to talk to them and uh, the 25 pick B, and then when I get into a, a next question, so I say, okay, now let's talk about, you know, how you think about risk, and I give them a couple of quick questions, and then then I decide to get into a, a an interview about, but half but half the people who get through that first gate, I have to filter out who I'm trying to say, and I ask them about the risk model they use, and then the ones that make it through, then I set up a conversation. And that's, that's a preview into a part of the uh, boot camp is the question. I have four simple questions. When you're in a high risk place, you're not here to, to necessarily vet whether they love your idea. You're there to vet whether the problem they have, that goal they have is the one you're focused on. So I ask them what their top three goals are. What are the top three challenges to getting to those goals and what have they tried and how has it worked? And then I shut up <laughs> and you will learn what the metrics and benchmarks are for success. This is a whole nother thing I call the hourglass interview. But once I find them, I don't say, do you like this? I say, what are your goals? What gets in your way? And oftentimes that's all I need. And then I, it, I find out their metrics and benchmarks by getting into the detailed conversation about what failed. 
And that's what I need to know. And you guys can turn and look at yourself and decide if you want to try out your new item with them and, and float it with them or just know you know what the benchmark is and go start doing some work. So is the primary purpose of Gateway Adopter to provide the best, cleanest signal for the customer development, product development, or what else are they good for? So uh, I think it's a sequence and I'll go through the three points that I made kind of at the end is, yes, they're the clearest. I think about, I think about I'm being an engineer. They're the best way to get a signal uh, to make sure you have a great signal to noise ratio. The signal is really clear from them about how, what you have to do to get to the mass market. Um, and by, well, like I said, I try to emphasize, it's all, not always super elegant or big. Then you have to know about how they think and understand so you can put, put yourself in their shoes for your marketing and messaging. Because if you do messaging that's for a late adopter, they're just gonna look you over. So how you message to them is different. And then the sales qualification, you need to help the team filter out the people who are gonna suck you dry with either the wrong requirements in the early part of the, from the early part of the curve or will engage and suck you dry with interest and questions and continual feedback while you try to polish something that makes them happy and create a final product, which will be never likely by the time you actually get it out there, you'll be dead because they expect a packaged product with all the risk mitigated out of it. And you can't do that. So you, the, again, the three is do the right messaging that fits their needs and motivators and make sure your sales team is calling on the people who have money and will write checks that actually have the skills to mitigate the risks of your rough, unfinished, imperfect uh, offering, but have the motive and skills to do it. Can I identify a gateway adopter from surveys? If the survey is structured correctly, yes. Because you asked earlier, I alluded to them right there. You can take those four, those three themes that I offered about how they deal with risk, how they, what motivates them. Uh, that's how I found it, right? I had, I had 1,400 people who answered the survey and I, I could have, if I'd known a priori what model worked, I would have gotten rid of hundreds of them and not even interviewed them. But now that I know, I, uh, you know, that's because I didn't know at the time. Now I've done it many times. Uh, make sure you have qualifying questions that fit the profile of those three issues. Yeah. That's a question. Sure. What if the competitive advantage meaningful to a gateway adopter is about efficiency? That's possible. I've almost never found it. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Love the idea of a boot camp. Um, this is a, a way that we could participate. So then let me join that question down with the other one. Um, if you would go to the, um, if you would go to the, um, partner area, participant area, and uh, vote. How many people, raise your hand if you would um, join in uh, participating in a boot camp with Patrick around this topic. Sorry, where is that, John? Go, go to the participants area and click on the raise hands if you would join in uh. a boot camp. I should, should uh, Patrick consider doing a boot camp? One, two, three, four, five, six. So six, six out of 14, okay? I'm not sure how to raise my hand exactly, but I did put my name in a participant on the document. Yeah, okay. well, you guys, if you guys want to, if, you're in, if you truly are interested, uh, you know, please enter your contact information or your, at least your name down where John's busy writing. And that way we can talk about how to configure something that, that makes you guys, uh, it's compelling to you guys. Yeah. So does this approach distinguish itself from the Jeffrey Moore had to say about crossing the chasm? Yeah. And I would say the, the big difference is he was descriptive and I am prescriptive. He never gave anybody clue as to how to walk into a room and filter out the people you don't want to talk to. Proscriptive, right?
Yeah, he was very descriptive. He had lots of illustrative stories that are very entertaining. He talked about the painful consequences of getting it wrong and the, a few illustra illustrations of what he got right. But I'll, I'll be frank, it reminded me a lot of that Harvard study early days, because if you read it, it's, it's, it was published in several, it's a grant study at Harvard, you can dig it up. And their first five, six models were very much like the things that he was saying, well, they do this and they do this. And he, they did real scientific research on if those were predictors and they weren't. And again, right. they just weren't. They did statistically insignificant. They were colloquial stories that had no correlation to uh, predictors. Right, which is bad science. Yep. So uh, are there academics who are studying and writing about this segment that you're speaking of? Not that I know of, because nobody else has done the work. So you know, if you're uh, publishing academic papers, you ought to put it on academia.edu and get a, a business prof somewhere to co-author the thing with you and start getting some market credibility through academics. Yeah, I, I'd love Are to do that. I don't, know, I don't own the data, so I have a hard time doing that. I can, and well, then, you can you know, get a grad student to regenerate the data. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that would be something I would love to talk to somebody about. I don't know. That's a, that's a, a space I don't know, but I would love to, I would love Foster, to do it because it's, it's very repeatable. Foster would uh, have grad students that would need a project like this. Yeah, I would know. Case, the call. Yes. Are there any um, other questions that people have that we should address? If you guys include your contact info, I'll do a call and talk about what the what the boot camp more details about the boot camp. That's uh, the next step there. And if there are other people who are thinking about just the consulting and do it, uh, yeah. So if somebody wants to be it, put your name right here in the put names here part. Yeah, he, and Shab is definitely going to be there. If they're yeah. interested in the boot camp, is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you want to go yeah. to the boot, if you want Patrick to address you. When they when he pulls together whatever he's going to do about the boot camp, put your name there. Any any other thoughts or questions before we call it done? And uh, obviously, I shared my contact info at the top of the doc and in the deck. I'm happy to follow up if people have other detailed questions. Cool. So we're going to spend some time next week working on the question of how do you operationalize some of this in the social media channels? Yeah. And so um, Alex will um, talk about social media and he's doing social media for a sub segment of, um, uh, uh, through a sub segment of Amazon right now. And we'll work on that a little bit more. Um, if you have any thoughts on places where startups need some extra help uh, to move forward, please send me a suggestion about other workshops that we ought to be running. And otherwise, thank you for coming. We will do uh, open coffee again on next Tuesday. We will do the workshop next week on noon on Tuesday. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. And John, can I just ask you real quick if you're still there? Um, yeah. Is there any way that uh, I can be supportive of this? I mean, I see you trying to take notes and trying to, you know, uh, be a, a host and all that. And I'm just wondering if you're feeling a little overloaded and wanting someone to uh, support any aspect of it. I'd be happy to contribute. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I think mostly where I need help is um, trying to engage the broader market in formalizing their activity. Right. So we have a lot of things we could be doing and people like don't take notes for meetings and so forth. So where you can be a good note taker, where you can be good at social media, telling the story to others about this, all of that would be very helpful. Danny Schwartz has been helpful in that way in several other of my meetings. So I'm starting to build a group that supports this kind of thing. Okay. Um, is there any kind of formalized way that you wanted to go about that in terms of like the social media aspect? I'm happy to talk about um, how to drive different pieces of social media and I can mm -hmm. tell you about the channels that I have in place mm -hmm. um, and work on that if you want. Just send me an email. We can sure. chat. 
Sure. Uh, can you just give me your email address just so I have it right here? My last name at Gmail. S H S C S E C H R E S T at yep. Gmail. Yeah. Great. Okay, I'll send you an email.